The following podcast is offered freely through the Insight Meditation Community of Washington and by Jonathan Faust. To learn more or to make a donation to support this work, please go to www.jonathanfaust.com. When I lived in western, western Massachusetts for a number of years, I lived in a little mill town, and part of my personal therapy was to go to the local bar in our little village to watch the New England Patriots on Sunday afternoons. It was in the heyday of the Patriots, or the glory days. And um, I've never had a TV, but I always follow them. So I kind of follow them on the web from down here. And this last weekend, Tara and I were teaching up in, uh, in New York, a relationships weekend, and drove down just at the final minutes of the game. So uh, I got online to check the score, and, uh, and I went to a, a site, if you're familiar with Reddit, it's sort of like a, it's a sort of a user site where people kind of upvote each other's comments and so forth. And there's a stream that discuss everything with the New England Patriots. So the comments were rather charged on that site. And uh, I'm censoring some of the comments, but, but here were a few. Um, expletive are wide receivers. Our offensive line just expletive. Expletive, 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 expletive. And I'm going to expletive kill myself. <laughs> Does anyone care to join me? <laughs> Tonight we're going to talk about the opposite of that kind of reactivity. We're going to talk about what's, what's actually considered the, the flower of spiritual practice through this lens of Buddhist psychology. It's the, the, the co-arising of wisdom, the capacity to see clearly, and compassion, the capacity to, to hold what's there. And it's described as equanimity. It's kind of a curious word. I, I mentioned once I was going to give a talk on equanimity, and someone said, what do horses have to do with, with this talk? But there are lots of definitions of equanimity I'll, I'll talk about, but, but essentially it means cultivating a quality of steadiness, a steady, steadiness in the midst of change. So as, as you can sense, it's a very high state of consciousness. So I'd like to talk about what it is, and then to talk about what it isn't, which can be a helpful angle. And to talk a little bit about how you can consciously cultivate equanimity through, through a particular practice. And then a little bit about what it's like to be living in relationship with constant change. How do we use our practice to, to stay steady in the midst of so much turmoil and turbulence? <clears throat> so this is the classic teaching story, which I imagine you may have heard. It's the story of a farmer who's uh, one day some wild horses just showed up in his corral. And all of his neighbors said, what good fortune. And the farmer said, good news, bad news, who knows. <clears throat> As his son was breaking the horses, he, he got thrown from one, and he fell, and he broke his leg. And the neighbor said, oh, what terrible fortune. The farmer said, good news, bad news, who knows? And right at that time, the army came through, sweeping up young men for the army, and they passed over his son because he had a broken leg. All the neighbors said, what good news? <laughs> I could keep going. I think you get the idea. <clears throat> we tend to very immediately go to good news, bad news. And when we can take a higher view, we begin to see that there's sort of a cycle to things. I love the, the story of when, when Gandhi was, was thrown off the train in, in South Africa. You know, because of his race. It was an incredibly humiliating experience for him. 
just a crushing experience. But that moment was planting the seed for his resolve whereby he would affect global change. The Patriots lost. But Reddit says, now they're really going to get it together. <laughs> a friend of mine went through a terrible breakup. And his girlfriend said, you need to do some therapy, because when it comes to relationships, you're a mess. And he did therapy, and he had all these incredible insights into how he could be more open and more loving. So has that ever happened to you? Something occurs that's painful, and yet it becomes the seed for opening new possibilities you couldn't have imagined. So this quality of steadiness that we cultivate through mindfulness. A couple definitions. One perspective says that it is, is not being ruled by passions and desires and likes and dislikes. So it's free of sort of the passion of liking and disliking. Another says that it is an evenness of mind, an unshakable freedom of mind, a, a state that cannot be upset by gain and loss, by honor and dishonor, by praise and blame, by pleasure and pain. It's the freedom from all points of self-reference. That's pretty, pretty wild. And we'll, we'll explore a meditation in a little bit to maybe get a little taste of that. Thich Nhat Hanh describes this quality of equanimity. The Pali word is upeka. And when the, the, the word upeka can be translated as to look over. And he says it, how he thinks of it is like when you're on a mountaintop and you're not bound by one side of the mountain or the other, but you can see sort of the totality of the situation. There's a great poet who once said, every now and then it's really helpful to take the 3,000 year view. It, it changes things. And when I remember that, which is not that often, it's very helpful. So that's a little bit of equanimity. But it can be helpful to really look at the subtlety of what equanimity isn't. As we were preparing to drive up to, to New York State for this retreat, we were just, just ready to pull on to 495, onto the Beltway. And some guy in a brand new black Corvette came screaming up, on the, it was a left-hand turn, came screaming up to our right and then cut in, made his left-hand turn, and by the time we got down to the Beltway, he was like two miles up the road. I have really been working on my equanimity when I drive. <laughs> I've, I think I've, I've talked about this. In mindfulness, we talk a lot about stimulus and response. That when we're, when we're not aware, something happens and we, and we react without even knowing, without even knowing it. Mindfulness has this capacity to open up that gap between what happens and rather than reacting, you actually have a capacity to respond. My classic response would have been to get enraged, to find some passive, away, passive aggressive way to punish him or just send him evil thoughts. Or it might have been to kind of get depressed at the inherent narcissism of our culture or maybe I would have pretended I didn't see it. Many people have, have noticed that as they begin to practice meditation, their 
is a habituation in the mind that begins to open up the space between stimulus and response. And it really is part of the evolving brain. When we're sort of run by the reptilian brain, you know, sort of the brain stem, it's all about security. It's all about mine and don't take it away from me. And then we sort of have the mammalian brain that sort of grows over that, that there's a little bit more relationship, we're a little bit more relational. And then all the action seems to be in the prefrontal cortex. And the evolving brain is about this capacity to feel our interconnectedness. The prefrontal cortex is all about our mirror neurons, about our capacity to feel what another person is feeling, where the, where the sense of I and mine sort of blends into more of a collective. And meditation is, is a practice to evolve the brain. You shift less from a, a self-centered approach to more of an awareness of awareness itself. So here's what happened for me. I was surprised and pleased. As I was driving down and I saw him like screaming up the highway, I realized that he was going to get nailed sooner or later. Karma in action. You know, if you drive like a maniac, you're going to eventually get caught. Somehow, I was able to kind of move to that 50,000 foot view and sort of recognize, you know, if you drive like a jerk, you're going to get, you know, you're going to get some kind of punishment down the road. But then I actually felt some empathy for him. Because I thought, oh, what a drag. He's got this beautiful, fast car, and now he's going to be paranoid that he, he's going to get another ticket and get more points on his, you know, on his license. When we're simply looking through the 50,000-foot view, it sort of gives us a perspective of action and reaction, kind of the law of karma. But what can flow with that is also a sense of empathy, a sense of sort of recognizing the human condition within all of that. Equanimity is that 50,000-foot view. But there's a term, and we'll talk about this a little bit later, um, through Buddhist psychology called the near enemy. And that is it's something that looks like it, but it's not quite it. And the near enemy of, of this quality of equanimity is indifference. Indifference looks a lot like equanimity, but there's actually kind of a cutting off of our heart. It can be pretty cold. We speak a lot about non-attachment in this practice. You know, that we realize that our attachment is connected to some degree of suffering. When you release that attachment, there's a sense of freedom. But it's sort of that immature freedom is a sense of indifference. One of the more influential books I've, I've read, it's quite a few years ago now, is called Ishmael. And it's the story of um, of a man who's going through the, uh, the classified ads and he sees this uh, ad saying, teacher looking for students. I thought, how arrogant. And so he goes to this room, there's nothing in the room, and then he discovers that there's a, there's a gorilla in the room in a cage. He, he's about to leave when this gorilla communicates to him telepathically. And they have this ongoing conversation. And Essentially, it's a dialogue between man and nature. And, and the gorilla is speaking on behalf of nature. It's a beautiful book. And Ishmael speaks of the laws of nature and the laws of counterbalance. He says, if you have a, a bountiful summer, you'll have a lot of rabbits. And if you have a really harsh winter following that summer, the rabbits are going to die. 
That's a fact. That's how nature works. And much of what his message was that our mistake is thinking that we have dominion over nature. Most or many of our problems on our planet are due to overpopulation. We have too many people living where there are no resources. And where there are no resources, the reptilian brain kicks in, fear kicks in, and violence erupts, et cetera, et cetera. So those who are suffering on this planet and those who are reacting out of, out of terror through those lack of resources, those who are fleeing certain areas, part of that is responding simply to the laws of nature. But how do we view that? We can view that through the cold lens of indifference. This is just nature rebalancing itself. And we can also open our hearts to hold that with compassion as well. And that is the deepest challenge in the practice of equanimity, to see clearly and yet somehow to keep our hearts open. So whenever you focus on developing some quality of consciousness, if you, de if you want to develop concentration, you'll notice how you're not concentrated. If you want to develop kindness, you'll notice how mean you are. If you want to develop compassion, you'll notice how, so how self-centered you are. In that same way, when you want to develop that sense of steadiness in the midst of change, you'll begin to notice just how much your mind is fluctuating all the time. Your mind is constantly moving between pleasant and unpleasant. And there's a little meditation that I have found very, very helpful. <clears throat> but as I was thinking about this, I, I was just reflecting on my, my early morning. It's still warm enough where I can go uh, paddling on the river every morning. And so this morning, I, I checked the weather, and it's a partly cloudy, and I thought, oh, good, because there'll, there'll be some clouds, I'll get some, maybe get some really good light out there. I do photography and video every morning. And it was 28 degrees. I thought, well, that's bad, but I can handle it. So my, I have an inflatable paddleboard, because it was cold. I needed to kind of inflate it, but I couldn't find my pump. But well, that was really bad. I was really annoyed. Then I got down to the river, and it was completely socked in, really just a thick kind of thick uh, clouds. And I thought, well, this is good. I'll get some really dramatic images. So I brought my paddleboard down, and the, the uh, river is about just three inches below flood stage, so a lot of water passing through. I thought, oh, this is really bad. It's going to be really hard to paddle against the current. <laughs> So I paddled out about 10 feet out to the river. It was completely socked in. And I thought, oh, this is good. This will be a real adventure. And as I was paddling out toward the middle of the river, it was a very violent current, lots of whirlpools. And I thought, oh, this is really bad. I'm going to have to pay attention. <laughs> I'll stop. <laughs> it just kind of went on and on. But that's exactly how our experience of life goes. So there's a little technique I like to practice, I like to share with you. And it's articulated really beautifully by, by a teacher by the name of U Tejaniya. And when you study with him, when you do a retreat with him, he doesn't emphasize how long you sit or how long you walk. But what you do is you pay attention to what's called Vedana. As our experience arises, the initial experience you have is just a pure energetic experience of here and now. That's called the first foundation of awareness, just the aliveness 
of your, of your experience. That experience of energy in the body, very quickly, without you knowing it, moves into what's called Vedana, which is the feeling tone. And it has three qualities, pleasant, unpleasant, and neutral. Without even knowing it, you'll then jump right into a thought form. You'll like it and want more. You won't like it and you want to nuke it or move away. Or you'll be indifferent and you'll get bored. And then from there, it sort of jumps into a recognition of thoughts and patterns and so forth. But, but in, in this particular practice, you bring your attention right to that immediate experience of just noticing pleasant, unpleasant, and neutral. I find it's kind of like a meter. I like this, I don't like this. So we'll, we'll try this for a few minutes, if you don't mind. You can close your eyes. And you might deepen your breath. Take a moment to tune into the sounds, or to the felt sense of your body, this, this quality of here and now. And without trying to control your experience, just notice if you can be aware of what's happening, and then in particular of how you're relating to it, if you can sense any subtle form of moving away or moving toward an experience. And we'll take one more minute. Noticing what is happening as it's happening and noticing how you're relating to what's happening. Now you might deepen your breath. And then when you're ready, you can let your eyes open. Or you can remain with them closed. So was that helpful? Were you able to see a little bit of the movement of the mind? It can get into some really weird spirals, because then you realize, oh, I'm judging. But then you judge yourself for judging, and it gets a little wild. One of my, one of my favorite, um, favorite teachings is uh, called Sin Sing Ming. And there are a few beautiful lines, kind of a famous line you may be familiar with, where the teaching says, the great way is not difficult for those who have no preferences. There it is. 
the teaching goes on to say, make the slightest distinction between good and bad, and heaven and earth are set infinitely apart. That's upeka. That's equanimity. Just noticing that subtle distinction between good and bad. The slightest distinction creates the break. It goes on to say, if you wish to know the truth, then hold to no opinions for or against anything. To set up what you like against what you don't like is a disease of the mind. Of course, that's not to say there isn't room for wise discrimination. There isn't room for decision making. But it points to a very beautiful quality that we can touch in for, into from time to time, which is receiving the moment just as it is. I'm saying yes to exactly what is here. Something quite profound happens when we practice paying attention. And that is we have a capacity to slow things down a little bit. Particularly when you begin to notice this impulsive grasping and pushing away. That you begin to see more and more into the patterns that are behind that grasping and that pushing away. Someone was telling me how she started, um, she left her job and started working from home. And she, she noticed that she started just habitually going to, to eat, just going to eat, getting up and going something to eat. And, it, and she realized it was becoming kind of impulsive. And then she, in her meditation practice, thought, well, what was actually happening before that impulse? to get something to eat. And she realized that for her, it was what would happen before is she would start thinking, I've got to get to work on that short story I've been telling myself I'm going to do. And that, that one thought would just sort of trigger, I can't do it, I gotta do something else, and she'd get up and go. <clears throat> and it becomes a very interesting thing to explore. And, it's something that's more accessible when you are on retreat where you can really sustain attention, is to notice that when you have habitual patterns, either habitual thoughts or habitual actions, to slow it down and ask, what was preceding that? And what was the stimulus that pushed me into that reactive pattern? The more you slow down, the more available that can become to you. <clears throat> it's quite powerful. You begin to see how, <clears throat> how you're reacting all the time. And just noticing the reactive patterns fosters that sense of the witness of self-observation without judgment and new possibilities might emerge where they, where they didn't before. Robert Frost once said, I can sum up life in two words. It changes. There are the, the four magic words that are guaranteed to make a happy person sad and a sad person happy. And this too shall pass. We find ourselves resisting change. And part of the, the core insight through practice through this Buddhist lens is recognizing that that change happens and your resistance to change equals the degree of your suffering, the degree, the degree of your dissatisfaction or unsteadiness, while your capacity to cooperate with change, to cooperate with reality, 
can open you into a greater sense of ease and a greater sense of happiness. As I've been on the, the river recently, for some reason there have been a lot of bald eagles around. So I've had time to kind of hang out and commune with them a little bit. So I did a little reading on these things. So they can actually cruise at 10,000 feet. And they have the capacity to, to pick out a rabbit from two miles away. It's amazing. So we were leading this retreat on relationships, and a lot of what we were exploring this weekend was, well, what's between you and feeling free in the realm of relationships, identifying your patterns of avoiding intimacy? And I was reflecting on a, on somewhat of a troubling relationship in my life. And, and I thought about sort of my, my pettiness and sort of my withholding and... In meditation, I, I thought of these eagles, and I thought of that 10,000-foot perspective. And from, from 10,000 feet, looking down on my, my petty little, my petty grievances in this relationship, I could just feel it shift. And I could feel myself becoming more of a, a well-wisher of this other person. I'm just recognizing how brief this life is, and why not be a well-wisher of this person rather than hang on to my petty little stories. It can be helpful to, to sense in that quality of, of altitude, of spaciousness. And I thought we might do a short meditation, just a short reflection on perhaps exploring a relationship in your life from from this perspective of upeka or equanimity. So if you like, you might close your eyes. And again, let your attention come into the breath. And you might just reflect on this quality, this very human quality of mind of, of reactivity, of preferences, of judgment. And if you like, you might bring into mind someone with whom you've had some, some challenge or some grievance or some complaint. If you can't think of anyone, you can make something up just for the exercise. And just take a moment to sense what, that, what this feels like inside, to hold this sense of separation. And you might imagine, if you could imagine yourself soaring to 10,000 feet, looking down on your life and the other person's life, sensing their karma, their destiny, and yours. Sensing how their life is, will follow its own trajectory and in their own time, this body will fall away. Their life will end, as will yours. And sensing this play of cause and effect. And sensing, if you can as well, sense your heart and to wish them well in their unfolding. And to wish yourself well. And you might deepen your breath. You might let your eyes open or remain with them closed. What these practices point to is what's referred to as the arising of bodhicitta, of the awakened heart and the awakened mind. 
the capacity to recognize that in this law of karma, of cause and effect, we all have lessons to learn that come through pain. And at the same time, we can hold a sense of compassion for ourselves and for others as we learn our lessons. This sense of equanimity is not passive or indifferent. It can be active as well. The example, I can't think of a better example than when you see a 15-year-old fall in love for the first time. You know their heart will be turned into mincemeat. <laughs> but you wouldn't take the experience away from them. So you recognize their lessons, and your heart breaks for them and yet you hold the space for their unfolding life and their unfolding heart. So we've been speaking these last weeks about these heart practices, and each one of these has a near enemy. And I wanted to review these before we close. We spoke of loving kindness, or metta, the capacity to offer kindness to yourself and to others. And the near enemy of loving kindness is attachment. At first, attachment feels like love, but as it grows, it becomes the opposite. It becomes clinging and fear and control. We spoke of compassion or karuna, you're increasing your capacity to be compassionate for yourself and for others. But the near enemy of compassion is pity. And this creates a sense of separation. Pity is feeling sorry for that person over there, as if that person was somehow different than you. And we spoke of mudita, which is your capacity for joy for yourself and, and sympathetic joy, increasing your capacity to be happy and joyful for others and their success. And the near enemy of this is comparison. We look to see if the other person has more or less than we have. And the near enemy of equanimity is indifference. And real equanimity is finding balance, that ex exquisite place of balance, rather than withdrawal, rather than contraction. So why don't we close for a, a few minutes in meditation. Again, just to sense the breath. And just to, in your own way, sense your own willingness to increase your capacity to deepen and broaden and open to your capacity for kindness. Your capacity for compassion, and joy and steadiness, not just for yourself, but to sense how as your heart fills to overflowing, how much more available you are for your work and your life, for those you love and for all beings. And we'll close with a few minutes of silence together.
if there is someone in your life who may be struggling at this time, you might offer them some well-wishing. And in your own way, sense this infinite capacity of the heart. And now gently deepening the breath. And as you're ready, you can let your eyes open. Thank you for your kind attention. You and your have a wonderful evening together. A few announcements. Um, if you'd like to sign up for the email, email list, please do. It's in the back. Uh, thank you, as always, for your support for the church and myself. And, and Lisa, you were looking for, I just got your email. If you are interested in joining a spiritual friends group, this is a, uh, uh, you meet monthly, twice a month. It's a collection where you, you sit in meditation together, and it's a kind of a structured form of sharing where you sort of share how you're, kind of applying mindfulness in your life. It's a, it can be a beautiful way to support you in your practice. If you're interested in, in a local group, Lisa's right here, and uh, you want to wait for a few minutes afterward, that would be great. And just to test your equanimity before you head out the door, we have cookies. So notice the grasping. <laughs> Enjoy your week. Thank you.